Hello and welcome to the Property Manager as Guest. My name's Leo Walton. In this week's episode, we chat with John Hildebrand, CEO and founder of Hildy Homes, and a leader in the SDR community who advocates for fair regulation and sustainable, successful futures for short term rentals. Find out when he got bitten by the vacation rental bug and how his creative side and background as a photographer help him create dream getaways in the desert. There's more with John in this week's episode of The Property Manager as Guest. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be joined by my very good friend, my brother across the pond, Mr. John Hildebrand, CEO and founder of Hildy Homes. John, how are you? I'm amazing. I love sitting down and chatting with my brother from the other side of the sea. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> it's nice. You do have to get up early though. Yeah. I've, I've probably dragged you up earlier than you'd, you'd care to be awake. Is that fair? But I'm imagining you sort of literally just in a, in a house in the middle of the desert, looking out onto nothing. Is, am I right? Is that kind of it? Pretty darn close. I'm 20 minutes outside a major city. Uh, it's still considered Scottsdale, but my backyard looks at like uh, this famous mountain called the Four Peaks and a bunch of cactus and like I'm on 1.2 acres. So I'm kind of out here in the sticks. Very nice. Dirt roads to my to my house. Yeah, it's cool. Very cool. It keeps you grounded. It makes you appreciate like the sunset and the dirt and the like just nature. It, it it makes you realize like when you go into the concrete jungle, like how happy and peaceful you are when, when you're, it's time when to you leave. get away. So yeah. And I get the best of both worlds. Have you, have you <laughs> always been like that? Or is that something that that's developed as you've got older, that, that desire for peace and quiet and sitting by yourself when you can? Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think I've always been like that. Like not to go too deep, but when I was young, my parents were always worried because I never, I didn't say a word until I was like four, <laughs> maybe that's three. ironic. Like I was really quiet. I was just in my own world and just like enjoying looking at everything. My parents are like, is this kid going to talk? He hasn't <laughs> even cried. Like what's going on? This is so easy. Why do people. And then I got older. They're like, wait a minute, this is not so easy. <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoy my, my alone time. I think it helps you re re energize the creative juices and like, it gets you refocused. Like I think it's important for people to spend time alone, especially in nature. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that? Do you think you kind of harness that when you're thinking, when you're designing, when you're styling an SDR? Are you thinking about how it can serve as someone's retreat when they come to Arizona to to get away from big city life or whatever? Some of the places, yes, for sure. Like I think some of the places that I have and some of the dreams I have of some of the places is that focus like, Hey, I need to get out of the work. I'll have a little work zone, fast internet, whatever, but I can get, get on my mountain bike and ride out into the forest for a couple miles, you know? So like, I think that's important for people, especially if you're working nonstop or working for yourself, uh, you need those retreats. So yeah, my ultimate dream is to have a lot more of those type of places outside the city where, um, people can just like zone out. That's it. That's a wrap. See you guys later. Can you just explain a little bit more about how you got into the, the business? I feel like your brother is involved. I feel like he, he, he's related somehow. And then what you're working on today and what sort of interests you about the industry today? I got started out of straight necessity. I was living in Malibu at the time. I was a photographer and I was traveling a bunch, but I wasn't making enough money. And I had a, I had a place that I purchased I didn't want a full-time roommate and somebody's like, Oh, you should check out this Airbnb thing. You can open up your house and rent it out. I'm like, yeah, right, dude. That seems so scary. You want me to put my house on a website? Obviously I did it and I just did just my room. I locked off my master room and the, the rest of the house. And it was so much fun. I had no clue what I was doing. All of a sudden I was getting people that were coming into Malibu and like really enjoying the house and like how I designed it. And it was just, it felt good to hear that feedback and have people enjoy it. And then as I got confident and started making money, I was like, well, might as well open up the whole place, probably make more money. And then that paid for all of my bills and my mortgage. And I was able to pick and choose my photography a lot more. And that was like my gate. That was like my gateway drug, right? I was like, Ooh, I got a little taste of this now. Like, can, can I keep doing this? I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, can I keep doing this? Fast forward, 
my brother who's in real estate in, in Malibu, um, very, very successful in real estate. He hit me up. He's like, Hey, uh, we should buy a property in Inglewood. They're building a football stadium out there. Let's make it a, an STR. I was like, okay, I trust you. You know, real estate better than anybody. So let's do it. And we bought that place and gutted it all the way down the two by fours and, and redesigned it and launched it on, on Airbnb was the first platform that we knew about. And it took off. Like it was like booking after booking, after booking, after booking. And then from there, I was literally telling anybody and everybody that would listen to me, like what we were doing. Um, and that, yeah, that's like kind of my quick journey. And then I ended up moving to Arizona, purchased a, a one place with my mom and we're a partner on that, which is so fun. And then my dad was like, wait a minute, what about me? And then him and I ended up purchasing a place together, which was super cool. We actually own another place together. So yeah, we keep it in the family, which is, which is fun. I think it's, I think it's my creative juices, right? Like, so I've been a photographer forever. Ever since I was in high school, I started shooting photos and I loved the shooting architectural photos because it was like, I can just put on my headphones and cruise around. And so I would see all these beautiful architectural stuff and design. And then on top of that, we grew up, we moved every three years. So we moved like 22 times all over the place. And I was really involved in with my mom helping find the, the house or like sitting with the designer and choosing what couches and stuff. And I never really thought about it then, but it was always fun. I just kind of like enjoyed moving in the process. So I think it was just kind of like seeing it all the time made me more hungry to, to get involved in it. And um, is it fair to say that that's the part of hosting that you enjoy the most, the setting up of a property? Oh yeah, for sure. No question. I love, I love setting up a property from scratch and like either it's my own or for another homeowner, helping them find the right designer and then working with that designer and like just seeing the, a vision come to life is like the most rewarding thing. It's so much fun. Like I could do that all day long. Yeah. And that's the <laughs> bit that you'd never outsource, right? That's your passion. Whereas there's other bits of it where you, which you're like, Hey, you know what? Do my guest comms do this. Like I'm less, I'm less concerned about that part. Um, combination. If it's for myself, my own homes, a lot of times I, I do it myself. Um, but I like working with other people that are better at skills than I am. So like if I can learn from a designer that knows how to design way better than I do, I have no shame of hiring her and working with her because I know in the long run, it's going to be a better investment. So yeah, I'm always learning. I love working with like super creative, talented people. So if I can learn from it, then yeah, I bring him on board. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm not a control freak. I know, I, I, know I agree with that. I think that's good, right? It's like um, being humble enough. Also coming up on this week's episode of the Property Manager as Guest, John Hildebrand, CEO and founder of Hildy Homes, talks about how much the industry has changed since his early days as an Airbnb host and why some things are still the same. As an advocate for short-term rental rights, John explains why having a voice in your community is one of the most important things you can do for your business. Stay tuned. What, what do you find today? The industry's evolved and changed a lot over the, over the last years, even within the time that you and I have been chatting to one another. What's, what's the thing you find most challenging about hosting at the moment? I think when, when I started, it was so new. Like it was still such a new, like I've been doing this since 2015, 16, really, really seriously 2016. Right. And I think it was like just mom and pop type of rental. You kind of just figured it out on your own as you went, you know, it wasn't, I don't think it was ever like treated as a business. It was more just like this extra income. Now the industry is so big, which is a really beautiful thing to see, but it's way more challenging. I think, sadly, I think the the mom and pop type of business is going to be very difficult to to survive if unless you build a team. So I think the industry has gotten a lot more professional, um, which is also more challenging because now you got to stack on more software, more tech stuff. You got to learn how to build out your tech deck. And yeah, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to launch on this platform and get bookings. Like there's a you have to do a lot more. You can't just set it and forget it kind of thing. Obviously you've been doing it quite some time. 
It talks about Malibu as being your first deal. Out of interest, would you still go and do that deal in Malibu in the same way you did it? Or would you, would that, would that not be interesting to you anymore? A hundred percent. I think I would like the way I started was such a good way, like grassroots. It's kind of my background. I'm like, whenever I'm doing marketing, I'm always like trying to find grassroots marketing, you know, the cheap way to do it or creative. Right. And I call it the house hacking. I think the house hacking is like one of the best ways to get into the business. Like I had a place, it was sitting empty all the time when I would travel. So why not rent it from time to time? So if I had to do it all over again, I would 100% do that w- that way. I think it was such a good learning experience. Um, I didn't have to take it too serious. Uh, and, and I was honest with people. I was like, yeah, I live here. You know, there's going to be a bunch of stuff in the refrigerator or, or cabinets, but help, help yourself and whatever. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I kind of do that right now, to be honest. After all these years, I, I bought a house. It's a main house. And then I have a detached casita. And I rent the casita. Granted, it's separate and I have space, but that helps me pay for my mortgage or live here for free sometimes. Um, yeah, I love house hacking. I think it's a great way to get your feet wet. So, ba- so obviously you've come a long way um, since doing since doing those deals back in 2015, 2016 when you started. Um, now, when you walk into a, a potential project, an SDR, something that you think you want to take on, do you... Do you know what you're looking for? Do you, do you really, do you really know what your market is? Yeah. So I think I have two types of personalities and, and two things I'm working on at the same time. Right. So one part of that is I'm always looking for my next investment. I know it's not as easy as it, it is to buy something right now. So if I'm looking for my own personal portfolio that like I want to buy or like maybe my family and I want to buy again or a a friend, my standards are way different. Like I want a crazy story as much as I possibly can. I want to be able to add value to that house. I love finding dumps, you know, that like need major work. It's just so fun because I know in the long term, if I buy a house that needs a lot of work and I clean it up, I, I instantly just earned a bunch of equity in that house. And if I rent it, that's just another cherry on top. Plus I like to use my own real estate. I like to go hang out at my spots and be proud of like what I built and what I've done and entertain people there. So if it's for myself, yeah, my standards are definitely different. I like, I like all different types of things. Like right now, my ultimate dream is to buy a bunch of land with a cabin, uh, maybe on some water or something like that. But I just haven't but if I'm shopping for other homeowners, which um, I do quite a bit now because I'm scaling with a, a, a property management company now, which I can talk about. But when I'm searching for them, I still want those standards for that owner, too. I don't want to just sign on every single property that comes to the table. I want to make sure that, A, the homeowner and I have a good relationship and we can we can talk to each other. Right. Then I just want to make sure that they're in it for the right reasons, too. Hey. This is hospitality. Are you thinking about the guests first instead of just your pocketbook? Like, and make sure their values are the same values that that I represent. And it's okay if we don't match. Totally okay. There might be another property manager that works better for them. But I love good design. Obviously, good amenities are everything. So I'm always looking like how we can improve this property so it's a win-win for the management company and the homeowner and the guests. So three ways. And I'm sure. You must have made mistakes along the way, right? Brought on owners where it turned out to be a mistake and either the standards wasn't there or the expectation wasn't wasn't set correctly. More times than I can, uh, than I'm proud to say. But, you know, it's a learning experience. And sometimes I'm brutally honest with myself and the homeowners. I'm like, okay, this is my first time doing this. I've never, I never managed another person's property before. So I'm not a hundred percent, you know, and, I think that communication is great. Granted, it's not been perfect. There's there's been times where I've had a, a major falling out with a homeowner. Um, and now that it's gone, it, it made me realize like, okay, these are the kind of things I need to look out for f- from a homeowner's sp- perspective. And I need to make sure that they understand what the potential could be or couldn't be. You know, hey, you may not get any bookings. Exactly. You may get one. But if you do this and this, 
you can increase your chances. So the communication is something that I'm always working on. And when you've taken on properties and it hasn't worked out, what were you, were you being, was it just a desire to scale and grow quickly? Was that what kind of led you to sort of take on properties that you then decided, okay, actually this was the wrong deal? Yeah. So with, with Hildy Homes, um, I was, it was the way I started the business. I never wanted to manage for anybody else. It was like, it was too much of a scary responsibility to be honest, you know, insurance. And I, I got to look out for this other person's home. I'm a homeowner myself. I know things can happen. So for me, I was scared out of my mind. I was like, I can't take on that responsibility. But, but the more I kept talking about my homes and the success I was having, more homeowners kept reaching out to me and they're like, Oh, can you do this for us? And I finally took on a few and I have a great relationship with this one guy. He has two properties right now. He's a real estate agent and him and I have fun together. And he, he goes through the same struggles. But as I started to scale that side of my business, I realized that there was so much more to that side of the business that I couldn't just wing it and, and figure it out. Like if it was my own properties, I can, I can wing it and figure it out. I could take risk. Uh, which I like doing, but other homeowners. So as I started to scale, I realized like, oh, I got to hire more employees. I got to get more tech stack. I got to do this and that. So eventually I realized it was uh, a challenging growth, but I really enjoyed trying to figure out how to grow. And there were so many homeowners coming to me and I kept saying no, I kept saying no. And then I would say yes, every so often if the property was like amazing, I want to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, and that's what led me to partner up with home team vacation rentals, which is like another whole step of my journey. I really do want to grow. I know where my strengths are at. So I teamed up with a home team vacation rentals in Arizona. So my ultimate goal now is to build this out 50 to hundred properties, but, uh, try to get some of the best properties. We're going to do it from start to finish. So the, the, the design, but I have a whole entire team now. So now I'm way more confident in onboarding these homes because I have an entire team I can go to not, yeah, I'm not just by myself. And I think that's what's really important when it comes to scaling. Like you really got to get all your ducks in a row if, if you plan on taking on other people's properties. So that's a really good answer. Um, uh, and I, I want to dig in on it. So really, you know, to, in order to scale, there needs, there's a learning curve, right? That you need to go through to get all your ducks in a row and make sure that you have the right processes to be able to, um, yeah, effectively take on relationships and make sure they are re re the right relationships and you can set a right relation. Um, you can set a successful, um, rental contract that's going to make revenue for you and make revenue for your rent, for your owner. It's actually harder than it seems, isn't it? It should be like, oh, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. But there's a lot of pitfalls. You pick the wrong property, you pick the wrong owner. It's not styled correctly. The expectations are wrong. So, you know, you have basically created the playbook over the last eight years of doing it that you can now with home team, just, just really put, put the, um, put the foot down on the accelerator. Pretty much. Yeah. And I'm, I'm beyond grateful. I got to say, and so exciting The the two founders, um, Elliot and Michael, they think a lot like I think, right? They, they really creative people. They hire people that are better than them at certain areas are not ashamed to admit it. Right. They're, you know, we got some of the most kick ass, uh, can I say that designers and you just uh, did. guest communication? I just did. So we're going with it. <laughs> yeah. And it, I've always wanted to be a part of something much bigger than myself. I think it, it's always like another challenge, right? I've been working for myself since I was like 16. So working with a, a group with, you know, and having that kind of responsibility and, and leading a team is, it's pretty fun, man. I'm not going to lie. And then I can focus more on my strengths, you know, talk with yeah. the homeowners, give them my input, my connections with Airbnb. Uh, it's only going to make the properties that much better, which overall will make home team that much better, which make, this whole journey that much better. And hopefully it helps the industry as a whole too. Maybe other people can see what we're doing and they'll, they'll take that uh, also. Yeah. It helps people cool. professionalize. Let's dig in. So you've, the route you've chosen next for yourself really is to heavily partner with this wider group of people who you trust and who you like. It's, it's not the most common route for lots of hosts, right? A lot of people are just in their own neighborhood, plugging away, getting tired, getting frustrated, 
you're very community focused, aren't you? I suppose uh, I'm loading the gun slightly, but I guess that would be a piece of advice that you'd give someone then, right? Is like be outward looking, try and find your peers because who knows what can develop from it. Yeah, man, I can't say how important it is uh, to be a face of your community and be that like kind of go-to resource as much as you can. It has helped me grow my business so much and it's helped me level up because I know I'm getting more eyeballs on my listings than maybe the average person, right? And all different kinds of eyeballs. So it makes me want to become a better host on all levels. And like one way that I really get involved is advocacy. Like I'm a huge advocate of protecting short-term rental rights and, and I have the best team, but I've met so many amazing people just through advocacy. And it's really cool because other managers will sit down and talk with me openly. And it's not a competition of being like, Oh, this manager and that manager. It's like, Hey, we're all on the same Mm. team. And we get to sit in a room together and talk about how to protect short-term rental rights And it doesn't matter if, you know, they have properties down the street and I have properties down the street. We're all in the same business. So yeah, being a voice, it has, has taught me a lot and it's a lot of other responsibilities, but I can't stress that enough, man. Go to local meetups, get involved any way you can, because you, you just learn from so many different people. Um, And I get a lot of leads from just being out in the community. What, what do you think's changed the most about the industry since, since you've been in it? I think it's getting more professionalized from just the everyday um, person signing up on on Airbnb, right? Uh, I think everyone's treating hosting a lot more professional. Obviously, it's grown so fast in the last, I mean, just out here alone, the last year, it's out of control, right? And I think, um, and I hate to say it, but I, I think the people that are just treating this like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I have a place sitting there. I'm just going to take some iPhone photos and throw it up on a, a site and get, get some bookings. I think those days are, are long gone. I, I think those type of hosts are going to get um, burnt out and not enough bookings and not making money. So I don't know. I think my opinion, I think the entire industry is getting a lot more professionalized, which it needs to be. I think hosts need to kind of police host and the bad hosts need to kind of like get called out. Um, I think it's a good, it's a good transformation right now. I think we're just in that period where everyone's talking about being a short-term rental host. Uh, like you said, there's good information out there and there's bad information. It's definitely, I always get so like irritated when I hear people like, Oh, passive income. It's so, so passive. I'm like, really? What, what's passive? <laughs> um, talking of technology, what's, the, what's the first thing you load on your phone or the first Google Chrome tab you open what, uh, that you couldn't do without when you're running your business? There, there's a, there's a couple of programs I always check. I try not to check my text message right away or my email right away. Cause it, that just gives me anxiety right away. But I love checking my guesty right away to see if we got any bookings overnight. Nothing is more rewarding than waking up and you got like two bookings and you're like, no way. I was literally just sleeping. And I got bookings. This is so freaking cool. So I do look at that. And yes, selfishly, I always look at Superhog to make sure that the guest either um, got verified or they're pending. So like I look at those two like probably every single morning uh, and then I open up my wheelhouse and look at my pricing, see what dates maybe I can uh, change the pricing. Those are like the top three that I do probably every single day uh, right away. Yeah. And if you took any of those, if you took any of those pieces of technology away, would you still be able to run your business? No. Yeah. There you go. No way. Yeah. And when you started, you probably started with the spreadsheet, right? (laughs) Oh my God. When I, when I first started, I didn't even know there was software or programs or anything. All I did was literally Airbnb. And I thought that was the only thing there was. And I only logged in the Airbnb and I, that's it. And I still log in the Airbnb all the time because I like the u- the user face of the the software and I can, you can see different things. But yeah, back in the days, that's all I thought there was. Yeah. I still teach people that way. I'm like, hey man, don't get caught up in all the tech and software. Like if you really just want to get in the business deal, just start with one OTA first. 
get become a master at OTA and then slowly start adding things to your tech stack. Yeah. So clearly you've um you started life as an as quote unquote an Airbnb host. You've now become a short term rental expert. Quite the journey you've been on. Um how much focus do you put on marketing to find your guests? Like how guest centric is your is your marketing approach? I'm still learning that quite a bit. My background is marketing. I love marketing. I love trying to tell a story. I love trying to create content and then watching the results of people click and, and, and let, you know, do a direct booking or something like that. Right. Um, but I'm still learning that, that process a lot. I think Instagram is huge and it's very underrated when it comes to hospitality for some reason in the short-term rental space. Like you're very good at it. You're very good at the social media element of it, especially. Um, do you think that's your secret sauce? Do you think that's why you've been so successful? Would you recommend other people take that approach if they're getting into hosting or would you say just double down and focus on being a host? I, I know the answer is yes, you should. I should tell people to do social media and stuff. Right. But it's not for everybody. So it, to say that as a blanket uh, answer, I think is incorrect. A lot of people will say, Oh yeah, you got to Not everybody wants to do social media, right? It's a ton of work. It is like a lot, a lot of work. So maybe you just want to hire a social media mm -hmm. team. Do I think it's beneficial? A thousand percent. Can you track everything? Not even close. Right. But does it work? Yes, it definitely works. Um, but you have to believe in it and you have to have a, a strategy and you got to focus it as a business. It can't just be like, oh, I'm going to post today. Oh, I'll post tomorrow. Like if you're not good at it or don't want to be a face of it, then maybe hire a team to do it. Um, but yeah, I think it's really, really important. I think it, it is one of my strengths uh, from living in LA and Malibu in the time, like when Instagram first started, I was around people that literally were talking about launching Instagram. Uh, so I got to see it from the ground up. So I, yeah, I think it's super, super important. I think content in this space, SDR space is very un underutilized. Still. Yeah. Clearly you run, you run a very guest centric business, right? You know, that's how you're focusing your styling, the homes you're taking on, the way you're conducting yourself when you're talking to your hosts. This is the type of booking we're going to get. You don't have unrealistic expectations. So you've got the guests now, whether it's an OTO or that's a direct booking, how are you going the extra mile for them? How are you making sure you get that five-star review? Yeah. And honestly, that part is so much fun. And, uh, you know, I have an, an amazing cleaning crew partnership with well and good. And they help me make sure that like the cleaning is at the top of the list of priorities, right? It's like, this place has got to be spotless. Right. And with that, they help me put out little knickknacks. Uh, maybe it's a bottle of wine. Maybe it's like a handwritten welcome card or note. I think like those little touches are important, but I do like to ask my guests questions. Um, Hey, what makes you come here? Why are you coming to Scottsdale? Why did you choose my place? Like I try to fill them out and you'd be surprised. Sometimes guests just tell me They're like, oh, we're here for our anniversary or, you know, our family hasn't had time to get together and spend some quality time together. I'm like, oh, cool. Okay. You got two young kids. We have a pool. I'm going to go get some floats for the pool. It doesn't cost me that much, right? Go get some cool floats for the pool. So when they show up, the unexpected surprise just makes people feel like I paid attention to that guess. So I'm always trying to figure out little ways to like surprise a guest with, you know, the other day we had a guest stay at one of my properties for like a month. So we did two bottles of wine. There's this, my, one of my, um, Kodiak cakes is like my favorite pancake mix. If you guys ever want to try it, you should definitely try it. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it would be super fun to like buy a box of these Kodiak cakes. And I wrote a note, like, these are my favorite pancakes. Like I wanted to share that with you guys. And they loved yeah, it. Love that. They thought it was so love cool. That. It's so fun. And that's marketing. It goes a long way because if that person has a really great experience, right, then they'll go tell five of their friends, three of their friends. And like, just to give you a good example, that guest that I did the bottle of wine from in the beginning uh, and the Kodiak cakes and all this stuff, uh, we ended up texting because there was a few issues that happened. We had a barbecue grill that went out somehow the main gas line or something broke. Or I, I don't even know. Right. But they were super cool about it. And I think me showing that I cared about the property, I was like getting people over there right away. I was like, I sent them another bottle of wine. Like 
those kind of things went went and go a long ways. So sometimes you do it to pre- maybe to make them stoked, but also prepare for if something does happen. It's like, okay, mm. well, John, you know, did these little touches, but you know, something did happen to the house, but he, you know, he's still a great guy. He cares about the property. Yeah, I like that. I think it just shows yeah. that you care. Honestly, I always have a love hate relationship with the reviews, right? Cause I think sometimes it puts host in a weird situation sometimes where you almost feel hostage mm. of the review. You're so worried about the review that sometimes you forget about the guest experience in that matter because you're so worried about every everything about a review. You know, things happen. It's a home. It is not a hotel. Houses, I mean, everything happens to a house all the time. And I think some guests just don't understand that. Um, so sometimes you're just on tippy toes for a review, right? Mm-hmm. And if you just take a step back from the review and just act like a normal person and communicate to that person. Like, uh, I think guests will, will see that and be like, okay, he's a normal guy. Like he cares about what he's doing. He obviously didn't control this situation, whatever. So yeah, love hate r- with reviews, but when you get a good solid review, you're, it just pumps. I was going to say that's like, like yes. that's like yeah. the best, the best <laughs> moment of your day. Right. Uh, imagine waking up to three, oh, three good reviews. You're like, yes. Um, I know. Obviously guests can sometimes be, you know, not what you hope they'd be. Can you think of any, um, <laughs> you must have a good amount of horror stories, but come on, what's your, what, what, what's your favorite? I mean, you know me, I don't really harp on the negative too much, to be honest. I think it's just like everybody can talk about a horror story and bad experiences, but like in general, I feel pretty lucky. Like it's only like a few percent, um, and when I first started, I pro- I think I had more horror stories than I do now. And this is not a sh- selfish plug or any of that stuff, but like ever since I put super hog on all my listings and I'm very clear that we do background checks and a security deposit. And like I put those systems in place, it, it lowers my chances of the bad guest period. And with years of experience now and super hog, I'm willing to let go of a booking if it doesn't feel right or they refuse to do a background check or a deposit or something like that. So it's very far in between, but I'll tell you one that was just too fun. It was right when I started and I just put a camera up by my garage where people can park. Right. And because I normally want to see people come in or the trash was the trash taken out or whatever. And this lady has been there for like a week and all of a sudden my uh, landscaper came is like, Hey, it looks like someone crashed into your driveway. I was like, in my garage door. I'm like, what? I didn't notice anything. So I went back on my camera. I rewind it. I see the lady who's staying there literally back up into the garage, fully drive through the garage and then back out and kind of look at it like, ah, eh, no big deal. <laughs> and walked in. And I was like, wow, that was like five days ago. She didn't even say anything. <laughs> so I, so I sent her a picture I, or actually I sent her a text in my head. Did something happen to the, to the garage door? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, my landscaper said there was like a big dent in the garage. And I was kind of trying to see if she would say something. I was giving her the benefit of the doubt. And she's like, oh yeah, I didn't bother saying anything. It was like that when we got here. Right. And I was like, that's, and I was like, okay, that's bullshit. (laughs) And then I was like, don't you think, and I just wrote back. I'm like, don't you think you would have, you should have told me that so you don't get charged for something you didn't do. Oh yeah. I just figured you knew it's not a big deal. Like I'm like, Oh, what a nice lady. <laughs> and then I'm like, all right, well, can you explain this? And I sent her the photo and video of her backing into the garage. And she's like, Oh, how much is it? <laughs> <laughs> she instantly, her whole, her whole attitude changed. She's like, Oh man, this guy's got me red handed. <laughs> and you know, it was an expensive garage, but she still gave us a positive review. There you go. Surprisingly. There you go. So things can be sorted you know, out. It was like, it can be sorted out. Can't it? it can be sorted out. Yeah. Doesn't happen like that all the time. Let me tell you. I, w- I always tell people just to highlight on that. Like if there's anything in your house that you literally will throw up and be sick to your stomach, if it breaks or gets damaged, just get rid of it. Yeah. Like take care of it. Everything in my house as yeah, it's painful when it breaks. I got to go to the store. I got to get new stuff, but I don't care. It's just like a part of the business. It's like wear and tear. Yeah. It's all good. Hey, you broke it. Sometimes we don't even charge the guests at all. That's why we have the, you know, security deposit, or whatever. Right. And sometimes we do, 
But yeah, I just had to say that. Like if a kid draws over your wall, maybe it's really cool. Maybe you put like a funny little frame around <laughs> it and be like, don't do this. It's obviously a, a stressful industry to work in, although you take it in your stride, you're nice and relaxed. Maybe that's the key, part of the key to your success, right? And your enthusiasm for it, I think, comes across in everything you do. Um, but when you're not working, what, what do you like to do to, to relax? I don't like that word. I try not to use that word at all in my vocabulary anymore, really, because work sounds draining and painful and you clock in that there's just something about that word that instantly makes you feel like, Oh, I got to go to work. Right. Oh, it's Monday. Like I love Mondays. I love Mondays. I get to talk to Leo. I get to talk to my team. I get to check in like, but I love Saturdays. So like for me, I'm in a great spot because I don't feel like I ever quote unquote work. I really do enjoy all aspects of it. Yes. Very stressful. Sometimes I rip my hair out sometimes like all that, but yeah. So I try not to say work too much. Uh, but when I'm not doing the business, uh, I'm a huge, I, I I've been really trying to focus on my health lately and w- working out. I have a really bad back and scoliosis and all this stuff. So my mental break is like ex- exercising. Like I love swimming. I love getting in the pool and just swimming laps. Cause nobody can bother me. Mm-hmm. I just mentally zone out. I love taking my dog on some hikes and some walks, you know, and just being outside. Like I know that you're a biker, like to hit the bike trails. Oh, yeah. I love biking. It's like, I did a, a 22 mile ride uh, this weekend and it felt so good because I haven't been on my bike in like three weeks. And nice. I was like, God, that felt good, man. I miss that so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, snowboarding, but honestly, I haven't done much snowboarding this year because there, there's been no snow and, um, but that's okay. In the next episode, we chat with Ben Early, CEO and co-founder of Holt based in New York. Ben shares how Holt manages to create profit consistently by developing commercially leased properties themselves using a team of architects and renovators. We also learn how Ben's background as a hedge fund manager helps him to manage risk and build a balanced property portfolio. So thanks for tuning in. Follow us on LinkedIn or Instagram at Superhog. And if you have questions or you'd like to be featured on a future show, get in touch with us in the comment section below. Goodbye for now.